buenas tardes, bienvenidas y bienvenidos a esta jornada que lleva por título Transición Justa. This que event da... called Fair Transition, Nobody Left Behind, organized by the Green European Foundation, Transición Verde and La Casa Encendida. I am Cristina Monge, I am a politologist and I am expert in transition policies and governance policies for sustainability. And the first thing that I wanted to do is um, welcome you and thank all these organizations for organizing this event, an event that follows the um, series of events that they organized a month ago that was Fair Transition for Europe. So I think that this is a very necessary event. It's very relevant because I think that we need to be more specific about what we wish for this transition to be. We have been talking about the fact that we need a green transition. We said that it needed to be ambitious. We said that it needed to be much faster than it actually is. But now we need to be specific. We need to speak and say what sort of transition it has to be. So this is a very ideological thing because there can be different models of transition. And that is why I think it is very interesting to start digging deeper and talk about what this fair transition is. It's not just a slogan. It's not just a motto that looks pretty. It has to have a very clear content. Nobody, need, nobody must be left behind. It's not easy and we need to see how to do it. And this is why the time has come for us to focus on this social side of things, social cohesion that has a lot to do with our way of life and a lot to do with the future of our societies and our democracies. So for that to happen, we have three speakers here today who are three of the um, greatest specialists who are working on this very specific topic with regards to fair ecological transition. We have Dirk Kolemans here with us. Uh, Dirk is the president of OICOS, the think tank, and he's the co-president of the Green European Foundation, where he is coordinating this fair transition uh, project. We also have Laura Martin Murillo with us. She's the director of the Institute for Fair Transition, which is part of the Ministry for Fair Transition. And Laura has um, arrived in the ministry after a very long as a trade unionist and um, working on this fair transition. So she's not just a protagonist, if you're the director of this institute, but she always has a long experience. And finally, we have Joaquin Nieto, who is the Spanish representative of the ILO, the International who had something to do with this fair transition when this started, when the international negotiation started summits many years ago, and he now has this responsibility of representing the ILO in Spain, and he has lots to say about fair transition, something that he has been working on previously. So two things with regards to logistics, housekeeping. We have simultaneous translation into Spanish and English, so you can choose it by clicking on the button that says interpretation. You can see whether you want to choose Spanish or English. And as we usually do in these webinars that we are now getting used to, any person can ask their questions by using the chat box that is under the screen. And we will be reading the questions during the conversation. We have asked our guests to not just do um, a speech of what they want to say, but rather we want to create some sort of conversation so that we can dig deeper about the meaning of that fair transition, what's the status of that transition, and what, what are the main elements. So if that's all right with you. We can start with Dirk Collins, who is the director of OICOS, the think tank, and who is the co-president of the Green European Foundation. Dirk, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be here at this uh, conference, uh, although I must confess that uh, now being at home in my attic is less attractive than just being with you in Spain and having with people together such a conference and then of course drinking Arthur's a good glass of Spanish wine, but we will keep that for next year, a kind of a just way of organizing okay. things. Um, as already said, I'm coordinating uh, the project uh, on just transition in the Green European Foundation because we think this is a key element of the necessary transition towards uh, eco social ecological society. Um, and yeah, if we just look at current uh, reality, the Corona crisis, which is kind, you could say, it's kind of mirror 
that already reflects the current structural problems of our society and makes them worse. So we already had ecological destruction, we had inequality, and this corona crisis only makes these things more severe. So there's, you could say, an extra reason on top of the existing for really uh, make sure that this transition, which is necessary, is a just transition. I have prepared a, a, a PowerPoint, so I will now try to share my screen. Here we go, if everything goes well. I hope things go well. Okay, thank you. So we all know this, but I think uh, it's very important to repeat it every day that it's not only a health crisis we are facing, it's a uh, climate crisis, it's a crisis of inequality, a social crisis, it's a crisis of uh, yeah, biodiversity. And so it's in the midst of this that we have this difficult task of real, we have to realize the transition fast enough, but to be, make sure nobody is kept behind. And so this is really uh, the real challenge for our society. And of course, just transition is part of this um, goal of system change. And for us, we see just transition as a kind of overarching framework to guide us to this ecological society in a just and equitable way. And I think the good news is that last year we have seen not only labor unions or climate movements, movements pushing for systemic transformation while taking into account workers' rights and livelihoods. We also see them working together now. To give a concrete example, uh, in Belgium, after the first corona crisis, our air company demanded for uh, state support. And it was the first time that the labor unions and the climate movements together developed a position saying, we want to protect the incomes of the workers working at the air company. But we also have now, if the state gives support, we need to have ecological criteria. It cannot just be a blanco check. So I think this is uh, very good. And of course, also the emergence of the yellow vest in France was a clear illustration that just thinking that you can introduce environmental policies without taking into, into account the social divide is not working. Um, as Macron did uh, first, uh, deleting uh, tax for the rich and then introducing a tax on diesel which really was a kind of uh, yeah, making the life of normal people that need their car to drive to their work much harder. That's not a just transition. A just transition would mean you provide uh, work in, your, in people's own environment. You, envir you uh, establish good public transport. And so, Sharon Burrow, who is Secretary General of the Global Workers' Movement, said it very clear, there are no jobs on a dead planet. And I think this is really a good starting point. And so what we need, and, and that's, I think, uh, how we can embed just transition in a bigger context, we need a transition that would transform the economic and the political structures that reproduce and exer exacerbate inequalities and power asymmetries. And so at its heart will be the creation of employment that promotes labor rights and improves working conditions while also encompassing gender and racial equality, democratic participation and social justice. So it's not only just about new jobs in, in let's say, for instance, green economy, it, it's a much broader and normative stance, which of course also includes that we have a kind of definition and discussion about what we understand as prosperity. What do we understand as social well-being? Um, let's say that the industrial state of the 20th century created a lot of good jobs, but we know at the same time um, 
was built on ecological destruction and also on people having to work harder and harder. So it cannot be just a kind of, uh, let's say, uh, trying to build again what was in the past. No, it's about a new kind of prosperity, providing a good life for everybody within the planetary boundaries. So just, I think it's interesting to have some background. Uh, this concept of just transition from where does it come? In the 1970s, workers in the US industry risked losing their job because of environmental legislation. So there was a whole, a whole battle and debate. And so in 93, a trade union leader, uh, he said, we need a fund, a kind of transition fund that would provide financial support and opportunities for higher education for workers displaced by environmental protection policies. And so uh, at that time, this was the clear uh, goal. And I can say it's very, uh, you, it's very timely, for instance, in Belgium today, with the Greens in government, there's a clear decision of closing the nuclear plants. And so the people working there are now asking the question, what kind of job will we have after 25 when the nuclear plants are closed? And I think this is a very leg legitimate question we have to answer. In the end of the 1990s, the concept of just transition was incorporated as well in trade unions in North America as also internationally. And so in the 90s, it really became, uh, let's say, um, the unions, the trade unions movements were able to make this concept of just transition part of the international climate discourse. The concept was considered at the Kyoto Conference and at the COP in Cancun in the COP21 and with the important climate agreement in Paris, it became an integral element of the international climate policy framework. And it's also part of the sustainable development goals with the concept of decent work. Now, I won't go into this very much because I'm sure that uh, Joachim will do that much, much better, but I just want to say and acknowledge that the ELO has played a key role in developing guidelines uh, to make clear what does this mean, this transition towards a green economy for companies and different stakeholders. And yes, since then, it's a hallmark for just transition policies worldwide. So I will leave this <coughs> for later, not for me. <clears throat> There's one interesting thing I want to uh, point to is that we can see that there are different definitions of just transition. And this goes to what was said uh, by Christina in the introduction. It is a kind of normative debate. Uh, what do we mean by just transition? So I think it's relevant. If you look at the perspective of trade unions, they focus on the future and the livelihoods of workers and communities. They emphasize the need for social dialogue between workers and the unions, employers, and government communities. It's about new jobs, social protection, training opportunities, and greater job security. Now, if we, this, if we compare this with the definition developed by the Friends of the Earth, we see a much broader definition. There they say just what does just mean? It means the chance of a safe climate for our future generations. It's about the distribution of the remaining global carbon budget between countries and to see how we can distribute the costs in a progressive, in an ethical way. So you see, this is a much broader definition. I think what is key in implementing just transition is that we need it at all levels. It can be part of a discussion at a company level, at a regional level, at a country level, and of course also the European Union is, is a very clear example where we have the Green Deal, within the Green Deal, uh, the Just Transition Fund, the Just Transition Mechanism 
And of course, it's also part of the global uh, challenge. If we look what are the necess necessary elements for a just transition process, uh, then it's about an inclusive social and regional dialogue. So it's really important that all groups involved are taking into account, can participate in the dialogue. Of course, you need measures to mitigate the negative effects on workers. You need support for specific regions and communities, which are the most effective. But it's also about enable individual citizens to live sustainable lives. And also the last I find very important, uh, the reference to farmers. Most of the times, the most examples, if we talk about just transition, it's about industries. For instance, uh, we have to close coal mines and we will build uh, windmills and put solar panels on roofs. But also agriculture has been, uh, if you look at agriculture, there also for many decades, we have this agro-business focused on production, on efficiency, and where farmers are locked in in a system where they have to lend money to always scale up, produce more, but earn less. And also so in agriculture, we really need a just transition. And uh, just uh, to mention, this is also acknowledged in the multi-annual budget uh, of uh, European Union, where for the first time, 10% uh, is earmarked for working on biodiversity. At the same time, we see at the European level, at the European Parliament, that still the old fashioned common agricultural policy was confirmed. So there you see this debate between an old and a new vision on economy, including agriculture. So this I already explained, so just transition is now really part of the European policy. And I, it's important to emphasize, this is really a, a, something different. Before, if you look at the Commission Juncker, everything to do about transition, about just transition, it was not, it was not the core of the debate, it was not the serious game. But we have to acknowledge that now with uh, Van der Leyen and, and Frans Timmermans, green, with the Green Deal, just transition, the aim also to achieve climate neutrality is really at the heart of the European policy. And as I said, there are 10 key elements in this Green Deal, including the just transition. Uh, just to give you a view how wide this Green Deal of European Union is not only about uh, um, it's not only about energy transition. It's also about the financial sector. It's about uh, mobility sector. It's about a circular economy. It's about uh, farm to fork agriculture. So in all these fields, actually, we have to embed the concept of just transition. And of course, uh, the most uh, the thing that really uh, I say today is the most important is the Just Transition Fund in the Green Deal. And this Just Transition mechanism is a funding mechanism composed of three pillars. And in, in order to allocate funding for regions in part to carbon neutral Europe. Uh, I must say it could be also a bit critical the overall narrative of uh, the Green Deal is still green growth. So there, I would say from uh, my point of view, from the point of view of political ecology, the discussion and the idea is do we still can mm -hmm. have growth-based economy is, is important. And of course, uh, how are we going to then develop new concepts instead of a growth economy? I'm al almost finishing. So I think mm -hmm. what are the challenges? We have to overcome the focus on national allocations. Uh, it's very timely. If I say we, do, we shouldn't have a debate within, between countries. It is more than just about energy production. It's the most uh, visible one, uh, the energy producing industries, but we also need systemic change in all other sectors. 
And of course, you have to work together with the private sector and the stakeholders. If you ask for case studies, we have Alberta in Canada, where more than 200,000 200, people work in oil, gas, and coal sectors. And since 2015, there is a national plan to accelerate the transition. And in 2018, there was a, a kind of uh, transition settlement for coal workers with income guarantee, rich education vouchers, and a relocation allowance to new jobs. Spain, I won't talk about it because you are the experts. But also to give another example, also in <laughs> South Africa, they are working on just transition, but there for the moment it's very difficult and it's not really uh, happening yet. So it's not always uh, an easy story. Sometimes it's quite a difficult story. And so I have no conclusion because my conclusion is that I really want to <laughs> listen how you are doing things in Spain and are looking forward to learn from your story and experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Muchísimas uh, gracias. Thank you very much, Dirk. Actually, you left it in the sweet point, right? For Laura to now take the floor, the director of uh, Just Transition, so that she can tell us the case of Spain, a case that is still alive because they're still drafting it, because it is being implemented, and because this whole process is being accelerated. And I am going to, uh, to remember that phrase, that there is no jobs in a dead or sick planet, really. So I think that you actually pointed out what are the key points of this debate. So now we need to land in Spain and Laura will be in charge of piloting this plane to land. So what are the priorities that you have set and what's the status of the situation in our country now? Laura, could you please unmute your mic? Okay, so thank you very much, Cristina. Thank you very much to the Green European Foundation, to Transition Verde and La Casa Encendida for inviting me to this debate that makes us think about the changes, changes that need to take place in our economy and in our society that derive from the need of respecting the limits of our planet and that require in-depth changes in the labor work. It's not just the ecologic transition. There are many um, vectors, the way in which we hire people, the structure, the demographic structure, the world is changing in a very rapid way and different trends are taking place in different different axes, different vectors, and they need to be governed so that the final result can provide us with a just transition. It is a real pleasure to be here today, and it is a real pleasure um, to be with Joaquin Nieto. I mean, I, mean, I'm I, I would like you all to know that I respect you very much, but Joaquin is the main, the main responsible person for me to be here today. And in a country where, as a Spain, where sometimes we don't really know the international role of, of Spanish people, Joaquin is not just an amazing director of the ILO. He was a pioneer working with this agenda, especially in the Anglo, and not in the Anglo-Saxon world, but in the Spanish world and the world over. So he is in between those two worlds, the world of the environment and employment. And I think he is one of the first trade unionists, uh, one of the first climate trade unionists. He is one of the first ones who went to a climate summit and started moving this agenda in the worldwide. So I wanted to recognize this, his, his, his role, and it is always a pleasure to be with you. And now as director of the Institute for Just Transition, and as a representative of the government, I would like to say that what we have tried is to focus this just transition um, and to make it a strategic element, as strategic as our uh, commitment to decarbonize. In 2019, we had a package that was that was designed at the same time, which was the, uh, the law for energy transition until 2050. And an energy plan that proposed a reduction of emissions, 39% reduction in a, during a decade that would allow uh, Europe to be able to achieve its objectives. And then a just transition um, strategy that was in that same package. And we had a series of instruments that we needed to have in the administration to be able to start this transition that we start now, but that is uh, 
is, is designed to last very long and to adapt itself to other problems. So we had an urgent action plan for the events that we had in the short term and we needed to, to have the same ambitious objective. So at the end of the process, especially now with this urgent plan that we considered for the closing of the mineries and uh, the mining facilities and some nuclear um, nuclear stations that are being reconverted. So we want to have zero impact in employment. And that is a very ambitious um, project, especially in areas that are depopulated. And we are doing some very harsh reconversion um, processes in this area. So it is important for us as a government, it was important to work in this this strategy as something completely central. So just transition needed to be central. Even from an administrative point of view, it had to be centralized. I am the director of the Institute for Just Transition. It is an institute that was created this year, and it is at the same level as the General Directorate for Energy Policy, and it is at the same level as the um, Office for Climate Change. So this is the way in which we want to work for the just transition. And obviously we wanted to have an institutional level and some resources that gives you the possibility of acting and reacting so that you are at the same level as others when you're debating and negotiating these things. And it is helping us channel solutions and it is helping for this whole process to be very seamless. And for instance, we're launching a green hydrogen process and and we launch it together with Just Transition and, for instance, storing facilities, which is very important for our energy system. And, and we include all of this in the Just Transition strategy. So this model of having this Just Transition policies and endow them of enough importance, I think is helping is helping us realize or set up policies that are quite agile. Now, the strategy of uh, just transition is not just this urgent plan. What we wanted mainly in a country such as the one we have with employment deficits, deficits is to think about how we're going to really profit from this employment possibilities to improve our competitiveness and also the opportunities so that we can improve social cohesion. And all of this can derive from just transition. We have to think a lot about opportunities because this is an a country with employment deficits. So we have to think about this just transition because not only did we have deficits before COVID, but now we have a COVID context that is going to force us to be very intelligent, very agile and very innovative so that we can generate employment opportunities that people are going to be needing. So we need we need to really uh, profit from this, uh, from these possibilities, and it has to be with equality. So we have to think that this just transition must not just be uh, giving jobs to men. It can. All, it has also to give jobs to women. Just transition has to also be an opportunity to create jobs for vulnerable collectives, and we have to have a special per perspective for the rural world in our country. And we need for the administration to also observe all of this, because every time we face a challenge, or every time there is a sector that needs to be re that needs to be turned into something else, or when we need to adjust a sector to decarbonization. We find a difficulty which is basing our decisions on data. Well, we have different sources, different sectors that are all of them interested in losses, in wins, and in the administration, we have to provide them with an objective vision and we need to be able to be transparent and promote uh, debate forums and social discussion forums so that this can be agile, so that we have this collective intelligence. Obviously, we also have to think about the training policies and active employment policies, which are two tools that are quite, quite um, that, are to, that could be improved in our current system so that we can really uh, face these challenges with, um, with opportunities. Now, in any case, what is true is that although we are generating this, this strategic framework, thinking about the future and how to help from the administration transformations that are going to take place in different sectors, in different territories, with different problems, 
Well, we also have had to work in this urgent action plan that has to do with closing uh, coal mines for 2018, um, that started in 2018, and closing our thermal coal power. We have seven um, coal uh, stations that are closing, and we will be closing most of our coal thermal stations. So it is a very agile closing process if we compare it with other other regions in the world. So we are closing these stations and in our urgent plant, we are committed to developing something that we call um, just transition agreements. We in the administration, I am getting used because I came from outside, but the administration usually uses those names and agreements or conventions is something that is often used in the administration. But what we wanted was to generate a tool, a new methodology that would allow us to get to territories that had already suffered a long conversion process and we wanted to uh, commit ourselves to very specific objectives with a new methodology so it's not about announcing millions because that's very easy you can say no we're going to uh, when we close this station we will uh, provide 15 million but we didn't want to commit on any number of millions because it had happened in the past we didn't want to do that is not that that budget is not important that's not what i'm saying but it's not the only thing that a government needs to do we didn't also want to commit ourselves to projects although it was urgent it was something that we needed to do because the closings are taking place and the urgency um, urgency is there but we uh, we didn't want to commit ourselves to projects uh, because they are they might not be the most adequate because sometimes they're very well intentioned, but sometimes we have to really see what are the consequences going to be in the mid to long term. So what we decided was to set up processes that were participatory processes consult um, with consultation. We had to diagnose the losses, the job losses, what jobs could be lost, what the economic impact is going to be in those territories, uh, what municipalities are most impacted by those closing downs, those shutdowns, and what, where should we focus our attention? So we needed to run a diagnosis, a diagnosis about oh, the present and economic situation and the future impacts. So we had a public consultation, we have audited it, and right now what we're doing is um, setting it up in 10 different areas. And in the next few weeks, we will be issuing the first protocols for the nuclear station. So we would have 12 different processes ongoing. So apart from the diagnosis, we also wanted to ask people, since we're going to do this and this is our opportunity, what can we do together? So with all the levels of the administration, we are working with the regional, regional and local administrations, but also with a great participation of the uh, trade unions, companies, and academia, NGOs. So these processes have been quite open. Out of the 10 that are ongoing, we have gotten around 1,800 proposals, initiatives, lots of projects, lots of company projects, but also some social initiatives that should help us uh, better make up the um, the map of this uh, just transition convention or agreement. So, although well, this is being tough and it's being hard uh, because shutting down um, a station is never going to be pretty. There is much uncertainty, always uncertainty uh, around shutting down uh, stations. And there is frustration and pain in many cases. And it's true that the participation of the people is being quite high. And that means that people want to participate in, in the design of their own futures. And we're also starting two initiatives that we consider very interesting, especially with regards to uh, participation and the collective co-construction of this territorial project. We are also introducing the tools to improve the participation of two collectives, two collectives that um, are not usually taken into account. Women, on the one hand, which are basic to revert or to, re to revert and avoid the uh, masculinization of certain areas, and because they're key, and, and, um, and because it's selfish, maybe, but so that we can set population in the territory and because without opportunities for women we will not be able to transform 
these areas and the participation of the young people who are not as organized, but they have to help us with their vision to build this territory where they will have to, to stay or we hope they will stay to work and live and, and participate. So, so that's where we're making progress. And this is a phase that, that is ongoing. We are now in a process of evaluation, evaluating all the initiatives. We would have to give it back to the territory so that amongst all of us, we can make the best uh, decisions. The um, energy transition tools are working quite, quite quickly. It's never quick for the people. But they're working quite well. And in many cases, what we have to build is, is an economic context that is much more multi-sectoral, more resilient. And it's not going to be the vector for energy transition. It's going to be different vectors, different, different drivers. And we in the administration are starting to think that we don't need a helpline for all the territories that is just a copy paste. We have to think what sectors, what subsectors can work in certain areas and which ones can't. So we have to do that with the people. We are working on it. It is a complex process. We have had to, maybe due to the time that we had, due to the roadmap, we have had to issue or create some tools at the same time. And actually this whole process is very useful because we are now in, we are in a very good situation to try and, and, and better allocate the European funds because we have identified lots of projects and we're working with them. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. We will talk about the European funds, but we can see that you have lots to say. No, no, no. That we don't have the time. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to highlight the importance of what has been done because I know that this this is something that you have been doing, participation and consultation processes in the territory and this idea of giving a voice. Uh, so it's so that different collectives can be a part of this, can be real stakeholders, women, young people, vulnerable collectives in the rural areas. I think that's key. Now, Joaquin Nieto, the uh, Spanish representative of the ILO, after what Laura has said, I don't know what you're going to, to tell us because it has been quite comprehensive. So from the ILO, give us some key elements, as specific as you can, because there are lots of questions already in the chat, and I would like to give the floor to the questions. So what are the key elements of the ILO? What is the situation we find ourselves in with regards to just translate and transition? Microphone, microphone, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you, thank you so much, Cristina. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to participate in another event with you. We have been sharing lots of events ever since the pandemic started. And I wanted to say that I'm very thankful to the Green Europeans Foundation and the Transición Verde uh, Foundation and La Casa Defendida for organizing this, this event that was so necessary and so timely because as Cristina said at the beginning, it is a very specific context to talk about just transition. And I'd say even more, it is the moment of truth. It is the moment for, for us to tell and hear the truth. And I am happy to share this space with Laura, obviously. She said, and she, she was right, that I was one of the pioneers of Just Transition. Why would I say otherwise? I have been one of the pioneers in the international agenda. I have been a pioneer in the idea and its development, but you are one of the main uh, people responsible for Just Transition processes to be set up in a successful way, and that's, that's a lot. So action is even more important than ideas. So you are right in the midst of it, and I and you're doing it something that that needs to be to be said. Yes, it is the moment for truth. Why is it the moment for truth? Because it is now where two agendas have met, two agendas that needed to meet, and they have met in this post-COVID agenda, post-pandemic agenda, because we're already preparing the changes, the necessary changes for the economic and social recovery that we will need after the pandemic. Yes, um, we are uh, going through a unique time that has generated an unknown um, unemployment crisis, 400 
400 million jobs have been lost and 400 jobs are going to be lost this quarter. We had never, never gone through such a crisis. The economy has dropped the world over. In Latin America, we're talking about 20%. So it really is a situation that is going to leave a very deep footprint because the health crisis is going to, to end, but we will have an economic and job crisis that is there and we will have to respond to it. Some countries are already responding to it. Europe is a clear case. We asked from different um, fields, different sectors for Europe to respond collectively because we could not have a country by country recovery plan. And fortunately, Europe is uh, responding with multi-million funds and the same is going to be done in the UK and in the US uh, with Biden's US. And I'm sure that Canada and industrialized countries will do the same. So there's something that pains us in the international system, something that we suffer from, which is the fact that we're observing that industrialized countries are making important investments for the recovery. And we, we know that there will be a very interesting recovery, but in the rest of the world, they're lagging with behind they're being left behind so we need to include as well for the eu and for everyone else we need to include a, an international dimension an international cooperation dimension because the recovery will not be possible the world over if there are entire regions that are left behind it will not be possible so beyond that situation that we need to solve and our general secretary of the united nations is insisting on a daily basis on this beyond that what is clear is that we the time has come for recovery not to be just considered as possible but we need to understand that this recovery will show that the transformations that we needed can be done and energy and ecological transition were necessary and are necessary. So this convergence of agendas, the agenda for the recovery with investments that are really going to have an impact in the economy and productive systems by digitalizing them, by, by making them more more fair, more just, that has to come hand in hand with an ecological transition um, process and an energy transition process. And that's the case in Europe. The European Green Deal has shown it and the, um, and the funds will be conditioned to the recovery plans in each country. They need to be targeting that objective. So that's clear as Dirk was saying it during uh, his presentation in one of his slides in the European Green Deal just transition is part is a is a seminal part of of our policy and it is present in all of the areas of transformation transformation that are required so so this convergence has come at the right time it is the the time for truth and the international institutions and i represent uh, the international institutions how have we have we reacted to this moment of truth we always lag behind because in the climate agenda we are lagging way behind and part of the climate change we are not going to avoid it i hope we can avoid the catastrophic climate change but an important part of the climate change is already there and it's unavoidable um, the warming of the planet is unavoidable but although we're late to the party it's true that in institutional organizations, we had already foreseen that we needed these transformations and we had been talking about the transformations and that we needed to have just transition processes together with that. So the objectives, the uh, sustainable goals of the UN show the spirit, the spirit of convergence of providing an answer. Um, an environmental and social answer so that nobody is left behind. The ILO, the ILO itself in 2017 had its own guidelines that are very interesting. What's interesting is that they are adopted by the, the three parties. So it's the governments, the world over, it's the um, trade unions and the um, corporate organizations that sit together to talk about the terms of this just transition in each of the of the different fields. So from that perspective, we're ready. It's true that it's been a long journey. And as Dirk was saying in one of his slides, it's also true that the first time that we thought about just transition in the negotiation processes was in Kyoto. And I was there. 
I actually put that topic on the table. And as a matter of fact, we found a very harsh opposition in Kyoto from uh, US trade unions. They just came to say no, that they were against the Kyoto Protocol. And, and quite clearly they said it. And there was a divergence between um, European trade unions that I represented because I was the representative of the European Confederation of Trade Unions and the um, US trade unions who opposed the uh, measures for the reduction of emissions. So that changed, it did change. And uh, Katrina influenced in many different things. I mean, there were debates in the trade union movement, but in 2007, we already had a conference, a very important conference in the US with 300 trade union uh, leaders from all the different branches. And I had the honor of participating where they adopted their commitment to reduce emissions. So that was a change in the process and now it is defended by everyone. Laura Martin Murillo, as the Director of Sustained Labor, actually worked a lot for this trend that Sharon Barrow expresses so clearly with the idea that there are no jobs in a dead world and that Cristina, who's uh, always so quick, said that a dead world, uh, not only dead, also sick. If the world is sick, jobs are, don't really matter. And during the Paris uh, Agreement, which substituted the um, Kyoto Protocol, and it is the most important agreement that we have to solve the climate crisis, we introduced just transition for jobs as a need in all of our climate change uh, plans. And that's the situation we find ourselves in. So what does just transition mean? Just transition has three uh, drivers. First of all, the measures that are adopted for the transformation of the productive model towards a sustainable model needs to generate jobs and they will generate jobs. The ILO has studied it and we see that for every job lost, we will generate four jobs. And even even uh, vision before um, before the changes in commitment with the protocol, the Kyoto Protocol, we thought that at least 24 million jobs would be generated and we would lose 6 million. So millions of jobs are going to be generated, even more so because now with the new plans, with this new reconstruction plans, many more jobs will be uh, created. So we have to renew our studies. The ILO has to redo its studies. And that's the, the basic thing, because if people don't see social opportunities, it is very difficult for them to really be committed to this transition process. And what we will find will be just hurdles along the way. Obstacles, hurdles that will um, make us think that the yellow vests were just a simple glitch. So. That's the main thing. And the second thing is that we need to help transformations because not everything is about um, getting jobs or losing jobs. Sectors, most sectors will have to transform themselves. The construction sector, for instance, will have to keep on building, but in a different way. In a different way, since the new buildings will have to be self-sufficient from an energy standpoint. And instead of building new, uh, new buildings and more intervention in the territory, we'll they will have to rehabilitate the existing buildings in Spain and the world over. And that is a transformation of jobs. There will still be jobs in construction, but they will have to transform themselves. It's just like the automotive sector. They will have to now build um, electric cars and self-driving cars and other sorts of vehicles. So many of the processes are just transformation processes. But there are other processes that are just about shutting down plants radically. We have to shut them down. We have to completely stop using oil, gas, and coal. And that means that the uh, coal and gas and oil centrals have to be shut down. And this means that we will lose jobs. And these losses, these job losses have to uh, be given some sort of support because even if we create jobs, they will not be created in the same place where job is being destroyed. So they need to, they need to have some sort of help and that's what's difficult. And we have to help them by offering them these new opportunities, these new job opp opportunities, transformation of jobs when we can do it, but also knowing and also articulating some uh, social protection measures that will allow those people to not lose their income because if they lose their income, then they will be left with nothing. And if they're left with nothing, they will oppose this transition. And we also have to help them in the, trans tra in the training processes so that they can um, 
so that they can get new jobs and in this new reality. And I have to say, and I would like for Dirk to write that down, that the ILO has said it, Spain is an example. Right now, Spain is the most advanced example in that field. And it's not me saying it as the director of the ILO in Spain, but it's the ILO that says so um, at the international level. As a matter of fact, this position is being recognized and that is why we invited the Vice President of the Government and Minister for Ecologic Transition in Spain to be a part of the Consultative Council of the main initiative for climate action and employment action that we currently have that has been launched by the Secretary of the United Nations, which is Climate Action World. So Teresa Rivera is the Vice President and she is also the co-president of this council. And, and this is due to that recognition. We have recogni recognized the work being done in Spain. So what are the keys of this, of this work? And I will finish with that. No, I'm sorry, Joaquin, but we have to finish. So you have one minute. Okay, in one minute. Not only are they in the laws, in the um, national plan sent to Brussels, the PENIC, they're not just uh, within the legal framework. We also have created tools such as the one that Laura Martin is representing here as the director of the Institute, but also they have reached effective agreements as uh, the director of the Institute was explaining. We have reached agreements of closing, shutting down coal um, mines and closing down coal um, thermal stations and um, energy stations. So these are agreements for just transition that have put on the table thousands and thousands of projects, of new projects, investment projects and new uh, projects of in productive fabric that are much more integrated than the previous economy. And I think that we can continue with the debate because this is a live experience that has been done with an agreement, with an agreement of the three sectors and with the participation of the whole society. Thank you very much, Joaquin. Yes, you have to really highlight the importance of the uh, trade unions in Spain um, that you were the protagonist of during the Kyoto Protocol, uh, because we have to write the history. If we don't say it, people forget about it. And maybe that has a bit to do with the fact that now in Spain we have that Institute for Just Transition that uh, Laura Martin Murillo is the director of, and that is why we have some success cases that can be studied, that can be copied, that can be um, an example of best practices so that they can promote uh, or or boost other um, actions in, in other places in the world. We are doing very badly time-wise, but obviously just transition is everything. But there are a few questions and I would like to ask them. And I would like to ask those of you who want to write something, you can just write it down on the chat and I will try to read all the questions. Dirk, there's a question for you from Lucia Baratek. How do you think that the, um, the, the common agricultural policy will uh, impact the just transition for the agricultural sector? I would like for you to be as brief as possible. If you could, Dirk. Very, very short. So here we see, uh, you could say, a fight between the old vision of the Commission Juncker and the new vision of the Commission mit van der Leyen in the Green Deal. There's a strategy farm to fork, which really wants to transform agriculture towards a just transition. But the budget for the coming years for the common agricultural policy was still developed by the former commission and was adapted and, and, and approved by the parliament. So now we are in a messy situation. It's, it's not looking very good, I must say honestly, but there's a lot of pressure now from NGOs and, and progressive, the progressive political parties on uh, to really yeah, try to re-adapt re this budget for the common agricultural policy to the Green Deal. But, I must say this is a, a good example that it's not easy to change course. It's a fight and I can assure you the agricultural lobbies were very strong. So uh, it's not a game won at this moment. It, it's a battle to be fought the coming months.
Muchísimas gracias, Vic. Eh, a veces cuando hablamos de transición. Sometimes when we talk about just transition and we insist on it because I'm convinced of the fact that this just transition towards sustainability is already taking place. It is already taking place, but it needs to be more ambitious. It needs to be faster. It needs to be fair. But sometimes when we say that, we forget that. Well, obviously, like Laura was saying. In transitions, there's always victims and there will be victims in this transition, but what are we going to do to try and limit the number of victims? And if there are victims, to give them some support. But with regards to agricultural policies, we see that clash as we see it in other sectors. Laura, Daniela Ruiz is asking you about the global vision that Spain has with regards to this topic. I, I think we're talking a lot about strategy, energy strategy, and I would like to better understand what's the global Spanish vision in that regard. So remember that you need to activate your microphone. Yes, the global vision that we have in Spain beyond um, energy uh, strategy. Daniel, I'm going to try and uh, give you an answer. From our standpoint, from our perspective, the just transition strategy is not an energy transition strategy because it didn't make any sense if you think about the new development of the territories. It is a, a, it's a just transition um, strategy that was included within the package of climate strategy, but it's an ecological um, transition that thinks about transitions that have to take place in tourism, for instance, or transitions that will have to take place in other sectors and adaptation that is required. So our, our perspective, our approach, because you know that um, the different solutions will have to take into account all of these elements. So it's true that in the urgent action plan, we are focusing on the needs, on the need to have an agile energy transition, but the strategy is much more linked with an ecological transition, something that is consistent with many other elements, not just energy. Yes, actually, if we don't have a global vision, it is impossible to have a transition. So it has to have this holistic vision. Thank you so much, Daniela. Joaquin, from your international viewpoint, MSR, I don't know who it is, says, don't you think that the green transition is um, not considering how dependent Europe is from the raw materials that are being extracted, for instance, um, solar, solar cells, uh, computers, everything that we are extracting from outside of Europe, uh, from a mining uh, sector that is destroying the environment. Are we going to say no to those raw materials? Can mining be sustainable? So, so this green transition in Europe, is it going to be done uh, while extracting uh, raw materials in an unsustainable manner outside of Spain. No, but that has to change as well. Metal mining, for instance, we need a transformation in that in that regard worldwide. And it's not sustainable. Right now that mining is not sustainable. And there are enough materials right now that have been extracted during the during my linea of metal mining. There is enough uh, material for us to change to change our perspective and change the focus and the ecologic transition not just energy transition ecologic transition is not just about producing energy with renewable energies it's also about doing it using as little materials as we can and with circular economy criteria that have to also be embedded within that transition doubtlessly so yes obviously we have to dig deeper in that sense because some of us still think that um, energy transition and ecological transition is just a partial transition when actually it has to be a, a, a very transcendental transition and in other words, if we do not protect biodiversity, whatever changes take place in the world of energy will be uh, insufficient. If we do not change our agri-food sector, considering that meat represents 30% of the emissions of the agricultural sector, not just through deforestation, but the whole system, the whole global system that we have, um, for this agri-food system that is completely inefficient and, and that we need to change. As Dirk was saying, we have to think about a different sort of production, um, uh, 
We have to take into account animals' well-being, and without those changes, without those changes, the ecological transition will not take place. So, energy transition is just a part within the context of the ecological transition, which is general, and it's also necessary to face climate change as well, because the effects of climate change on biodiversity and ecosystems can also be. Um, offset with responsibility in other sectors and COVID has helped us in that sense. Yes, yes, that's true. It has allowed us to understand this codependence of the different sectors. Yes, yes, this zoonosis process also makes us think certain aspects of globalization and it helps us understand some um, aspects of relocation of certain um, economic activities. That's also very interesting because that could also reduce the energy consumption and emissions that are linked to transport of goods and people because it, it makes no sense as it exists. Uh, as it is right now. Maril, Marisol Soto was asking uh, this question, but I think it's sufficiently answered. Laura, Paola is asking about a concrete example of ecological transition that is taking place right now in Spain. Could you give us some specific cases? Well, we have Transitando in this urgent transition plan. We have Andorra and Teruel. Um, we have three processes in Asturias. We have three processes in Castilla y León. And what I can tell you right now is that we are identifying what will be the final map. What I can tell you is what some companies are doing. We, in this um, agreement that Joaquin was talking about, what we told electricity companies that wanted to shut down their, their stations, we said, shouldn't you propose something in the territory before you leave? Because these are big companies who want to stay here and so on. So they have created some projects. So I could tell you the projects that I currently have that are the ones that I really want to share, but I can't, I can't right now because they have to be evaluated. We have to see if we could get all the authorizations and so on. So we have to work on it during the next year. But for instance, um, in Guardaolilla, we are closing um, a station that was 300 megas. It was a thermal station and Iberdrola has um, offered the possibility of creating a park. It was an access that they had, so they proposed to create a PV park of 400 megas. And beside that, the company is now creating a project, an innovation project, and they have reached an agreement with, with the city council of of the municipality of Guardo so that they can have a vocational training process. That's what the company is doing. So what we're doing in the area is to look at the projects, what projects this PV station could create, because that could be interesting for a few years, but we have to guarantee that there will be jobs remaining there once we finish with that PV um, station, that PV farm. So we need to see what projects would make sense to complete that economic situation. So that's what we're doing. We're choosing those projects. So these specific cases are taking place already in 10 different territories in Spain. But the final map, well, I can tell you about Belilla, but I could tell you about Aragon as well. But it's easier when you have big projects that have already been announced by the companies. And in the administration, we are trying to be uh, very, very careful. We are just looking at the different interactions because we need, in the end, for the final result to be good from an economic standpoint as well. I know that's not your question, but I think it's very interesting because I'm learning about this. For instance, the, um, the grants given to companies in the mining areas, they have given those uh, the subsidies back. So in the end, we have not been able to reach the objectives that we wanted. Sometimes you give you give um, help to a project that is isolated. And what we're now trying to do is create a group of different economic initiatives that could feed off each other, that could create a resilient model. So I can't really give you lots of details, specific details, but in many of the areas, we already have initiatives that the companies are going to set up and other projects that we are now working on. So next year, we will be able to see what the final picture is. Okay, thank you, Laura. I think that 
there is one website at least or a document that you have sent us where we have some of the cases that where you documented some of the cases so if you want to write it down on the chat that'd be good i will ask you something else later on but dirk wanted to take the floor but i did not give him the floor so dirk go ahead because i think that you wanted to say something about what uh, joaquin was saying yes thank you it's about um the amount of materials we need for this transition and I think uh, on the one hand, it's correct. We already mined for decades and hundreds of years the, the metals like copper and iron, but these new, in, these new technologies, uh, renewables, they need these rare metals. And so uh, to put it simple, if you want to change every car that now runs on petrol by an electric car, there will be, we will need a lot of mining for these rare metals which will affect countries in the south, uh, will affect communities. Mm -hmm. And so a just transition is not only about making the production more efficient and let's say uh, sustainable in, from a kind of environmental uh, view, but it's also about sufficiency. We will have to buy mm -hmm. and produce less cars. We will have to reuse things. And so it's also about shrinking our consumption level in order that the, the, the materials we will, we will have in our circular economy are, can, are enough in a way. The future is urban mining, reusing things we have. It's not always new mining. And so just transition for me is also translating this goal of within planetary <laughs> boundaries into a kind of a view of sufficiency, prosperity without growth. So I think this is also a key element in this, uh, this, in this debate. Muchísimas gracias por recuperar este tema y hacer énfasis en eso. Covering that topic and highlighting that conception of the limits, of the planetary limits. Okay, Laura, uh, coming back to Spain, once again, I wanted to ask you a very specific question. You were saying, there are things being set up. We see that uh, grants have been given to companies that have given them back because they couldn't put in place a project. So this is a trap question. What elements of evaluation for public policies have you included in these just transition plans? Because we are doing things, you are leading public policies that have been set up for the first time. So I understand that the level of, of uncertainty has to be very high. We don't know what works best, what works worst. So that's why the public policies require a greater evaluation to know what works, what doesn't work, what kind of works, and if it doesn't work, why doesn't it work, and if it does work, what impact does it have? So um, a dynamic of evaluation of public policies that you know I'm a fan of. So, so how is it being done? I, I also love them. I am also a fan of them because otherwise, why do we do them? If we can't, if we can't learn from them, why should you do it? So, so for just transition, we have an intermediate assessment. So for each agreement or convention, we have indicators and we have to do an evaluation. But beyond that, we really wanted to learn from what had been done previously. So what we're doing at the same time is evaluating the previous policies. So now what we have to do is set up the new um, lines to give support and help. And what we have been doing, for instance, these last few weeks, us to look at all the um, all the grants given to companies what were the results obtained in the different regions in the different sectors so we don't really have much information because during the last decades the administration hasn't really been very responsible in in this need of creating um, an inventory of all this information and evaluating themselves but but we are starting to do it we are starting to do it um, Actually, because in order to create new tools, you can you can think of something that you think is great, but it had already been done and it wasn't good. So we're doing that work um, and I'm learning a lot. And as a matter of fact, I have been in this world for a very long time and I have read a lot and it's surprising because the study and the data are quite surprising. And, and we have many opinions or prejudices that we had built in an easy way. So from now onward, all the conventions or the agreements will be evaluated. We are trying to be very transparent. All the diagnostics have an external evaluation. They have some consultation processes. So 
what we want is for everything that we produce to be uploaded in the horrible website that the institute has that we will change I'm, I'm just telling you we will change that website and as we go along not only will we evaluate them at the end of the process but we also want to be able to follow up on it so that in the next three years for instance with the recovery plan there will be lots of funds lots of policies lots of initiatives and maybe that that possibility of that traceability and providing society with that information is going to help us a lot. It's going to help us improve the situation, I hope, I hope. Yes, that's key. Now that we were talking about the website, thank you, thank you so much, Raul, for the link. We now have it here, everyone can read it. So uh, Daniela is asking a question that I think is cross-cutting for everyone, so I'll, I'll just say the question and you can answer from your own viewpoint. You, Dirk, from, from your work in the Green European Foundation, um, Joaquin from the international viewpoint of the ILO and Laura from the Spanish perspective. What is the strategy for the redistribution of resources from big com companies to small companies? Because a transition such as this one, if it is just not all companies have the same options, not all companies have the same tools, not all of them have the same possibilities to tackle this. So what are you thinking from a strategic point of view? Dirk, do you want to start? El, el micro, Dirk. Well, it is clear, and, and I must say also now the current COVID crisis shows is that big companies have more uh, resources to handle a crisis. So uh, also when you have a transition period, it is clear that smaller companies, uh, family companies, and, and so need specific support. So I think therefore we really have to develop specific support mechanisms uh, specific mechanisms for financial aid, uh, for skill work to um, yeah, really make sure that not only the big ones survive and we see the small ones uh, having a more difficult times. I think for this, you really need um, local and regional transition plans. It's very hard to have this kind of overall plan that fits everywhere. And I think the 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 challenge, the challenge is, is to develop kind of support systems where you um, allow to establish an ecosystem of smaller companies, also of citizens' corporations. We see a whole new wave of citizens' corporation in the field of renewable energy, in the field of local food systems. We see also local currencies. So I think we need regional transition plans that focus on um, these smaller companies and you could say this is also a kind of circular economy because if you support local uh, companies much more value will stay in the community so i think this is a key element but there's no what I would i say there's no silver bullet or you really have to see for every region what is the type of local companies that would thrive on in, in a just transition and which companies need support. And of course, transition is always also a difficult process because some sectors, we want to shrink certain sectors, whether they're the companies are big or small, and we have to build new ones. And to give one example, what we should do today is to send pilots of, air, pilots of airplanes. We should send them to school so they learn how to drive with trains, to give one example. But these are the things uh, we have to do for big and small companies. Thank you so much, Dirk. You have said one of the keywords that I hadn't used, which is ecosystem. I hadn't heard that word previously. In the idea of transition, we ha always have to go back to that idea of ecosystems that can generate jobs that are respectful with the environment that are considered with just uh, with with social justice in opposition to a monoculture with just one or two companies that have been in an area exploiting all the natural resources so i think it's one of the keys joaquin give us your international vision well we think my microphone is it on yes it is on okay it's on so we think that we need all the companies, the big ones, the average sized, um, and the small ones, and the very small ones. 
all of them are going to have to contribute. And now talking about the big companies, I'm not thinking just about energy companies. I'm also thinking about the financial sector. The financial sector is key. If we want for investments to, to keep on getting here, if we want public investment and recovery, if we want them to have the impact that they should have, then they have to have a lever effect. They have to allow to, to multiply by four or by 10 the effects of these um, investments. It is, we need them. So we need the financial sector. The financial sector has to go in that direction. And the key is what stimulus is going to be given so that all the companies are aligned in that direction. And the key is what measures are going to be adopted to help for that transformation of all those companies that can transform themselves and so that we can help uh, new projects come to life to help new um, company creation. So it's true, localized activity, localized activity is a stimulus for the creation of companies within the territory. And doubtlessly that, that makes things easier. An economy that is more diversified allows for a greater sustainability, not just for financial sustainability, but also ecological sustainability. But in this process, many companies are going to disappear. Many companies, big average size and small companies, they're going to disappear. And we need to really take that into account so that we can give our support to those transformation processes and so that, that those companies that will disappear are, are offset by the creation of new companies. And that is what just transition conventions are for. And as the director of the Institute, these plans will be presented next year. But I think that they will provide us with very interesting results in the creation of new small uh, companies or in the transformation of small and medium-sized companies. This is a very interesting thing within this new concept of change of the productive uh, system, Laura. Uh, well, thank you very much, Joaquin. Laura, could you give us your Spanish vision? Well. I think that, especially for the energy system at the government, we have been really working on the idea of a self-consumption and energy communities. We want for the energy system to be populated with different stakeholders. We want um, for new tools for the smaller stakeholders. And the areas, as you said, Cristina, the areas where we're working right now with the urgent plan were monocultures, uh, coal, it was actually a big companies. It was a big company that provided education, that provided jobs, it provided everything. I mean, the company was a territory, but it's true that it doesn't make any sense to go from one big company, from, from a, an economy that, uh, that was created by just one company to uh, an economy that is also protected by one big company. But it's true that when that big company presents some sort of project, it does give a peace of mind to the territory. So we have to, to try and find the balance. So we have to try and have a diverse ecosystem. So no territory should be um, dependent of just one company. And that happens to us in many things. Sometimes one company, we know that when an industry closes down, then a whole region can be crushed. We know the impact that that can have. Uh, just like we need that, just like we need to have that, we also need more medium-sized and small companies for a sectorial diversification. So in reconversion sectors where many companies are closed, we need to have projects, big projects, not exclusive projects, because that makes makes it easier because because they have quite quite a lot of power. So we need to find ourselves a place between those two. Well, yes, the key is for those big companies to be the engine for everyone else so that they can favor the creation of that ecosystem. Yes, actually the change that we are seeing in the productive systems are going in that direction. And on the one hand, not on the other, but the big uh, productive units will give birth to smaller productive um, units that are interconnected. And digitization also um, allows for that for that interconnection to happen. So this interconnection, you know, supply chains, processes that are very complex, that provide new opportunities that are very positive, but that also generates a series of, um, of, of effects that need to be corrected. So every change will a cause for a different change in all the directions that we need to handle with criteria of just transition and environmental transition. Okay, we will have um, a last 
round of questions because we are not doing very well with regards to time, but we still have lots of questions. So there are three questions, one for each. And I'm actually going to ask you to tell us what would be the three main priorities that you currently believe are basic to make pro progress in this just transition. So if you had to write your letter to Santa, what would you ask? To the private, public, social sectors, whatever you want. And we're going to uh, give you the floor. So I will, I will ask you for those priorities. Okay, Dirk, question. Ana Magdalena, creo que es. ¿Cómo reducir el consumo si nuestra economía necesita Consumption crecer? if our economy needs to constantly grow in order not to crash. I'm sorry if it is a very silly question. No, it's not basic. This is actually the question, really. So, Dirk, how to reduce consumption if, if our economy needs to keep on constantly working? What are the three main priorities for just transition? Thank you for this very simple question to close this uh, session. I think it's not true that our <laughs> economy always has to grow. It's a very recent way of, of thinking. Actually, it only was after the Second World War that GDP was introduced as a kind of uh, bad thermometer. What I think is essential is that to have a good life, you don't need every week to consume more. What you need is the guarantee that your basic needs are fulfilled. So what we need more uh, with that put that on top in my letter, is that we invest in those collective structures that allow us to live a good life, a sustainable life with less consumption. So if there's good public transport, I don't need a car. If there's a lot of good uh, local food, I don't need the agribusiness. I don't need uh, vegetables from Peru. So this is number one. Number two is, Please build the new economy uh, embracing the citizens' initiatives. There are so many citizens start, uh, being social entrepreneurs, uh, establishing co-ops built on these energies, on this, um, yeah, this, this passion to take the future again in their hands. And the third one is let's try to build a more relaxed society. It's one of, we, at this moment, we have a burnout of people working too hard in their jobs and we have a burnout of the planet. So let's have a more relaxed society. And if you pe ask people what in the end is the most important, it's not a new smartphone, it's having time for our friends and our family. So these are my three key elements in my letter. Qué bien. Y además podemos hacer oh, lovely. And we could have webinars such as this one. We could have webinars that would last uh, for, for the whole day because we wouldn't have to be limiting our time. Okay, Joaquin. Uh, Lucia is asking, Lucia Batek is asking. He asks if you're optimistic with regards to Spain's possibility to achieve the reduction objectives in the Paris Protocol. And if you think that this just transition will be successful, I say that it will be successful. Do you think that could be escalated to other levels? And your three priorities as well. Okay, so first, I completely agree with what Dirk was saying about, about this transformation. This transformation also has to include other elements, and actually those elements are there. For instance, education, care, public health. These are some of the important lessons learned from the pandemic, and they will be there, and they will be there during our recovery processes. The whole care economy and all the social relations behind care is going to change, and it's going to change because of how much women are demanding that they don't want to live in a society that discriminates um, against them. They don't want to live in an unequal society and they don't want to have an unequal position in the labor market. So this is going to change uh, the labor market, but also the care, the care industry. And that is going to be basic. And we will have now stronger health policies in education and training. We will see it as a right um, 
during our whole lives. So these are changes that from the employment point of view are going to change lots of jobs. So those, and now let me write my letter, my letter to Santa. So first of all, an international recovery, not, it needs to be a world recovery. It cannot just be a recovery for industrialized countries because it's not possible. I mean, not even prosperity is possible in a world where part of the world is in poverty. That's the first thing. Second, just transition needs to be at the core of all of these transitions. Just transition has to be sustainable from an environmental point of view, because if it's not, it will not be just. We cannot have social development. There will be a social implosion and there will be no justice. So it has to be just with a fair work, decent jobs. So just transition has to be at the core of everything. And the third one would be participation, social dialogue, the participation of society. We have to go towards a society where everything needs to be uh, better distributed. There will be a public economy and a private economy, but there will be a third sector economy, a social economy, a cooperative economy that has a very important space and that should over a third of the economy. And this means that we need more participation in every field, in every sector with social dialogue and with participation at all levels. So those would be my three wishes. Okay, thank you very much, Joaquin. And Laura, our general director, we uh, finish with you. Berta is asking about pedagogical matters what we need to include in this just transition strategies for the society to understand it, to really be involved in them and be engaged with them. So we're going to close with pedagogy. I am not going to be very pedagogical, I'm afraid. I'm going to be, I'm not going to be very pedagogical because the problem that we have with people who lose their jobs is not a pedagogical problem. It's a, pro it's an, it's a problem of need. So it doesn't matter how much you explain things to people who are 60 years old and who counted on um, of being retired in their jobs, they're going to be completely changed. So I can, I can try and give them support, but I cannot be pedagogical. So first of all, we have to be honest. We have to be honest with the fact that there is need because the worst scenario is to not have a transition, an ecological transition, that's the worst scenario. Not decarbonizing is the worst scenario. So everything is better than that. We need a transition, but we also need to be sensible. We need to see how those changes are going to take place and that they're very difficult. And it doesn't matter if you can show them that there will be an employment. Maybe there are differences in salaries. And maybe those differences in salaries can have an influence in what your family can do or cannot do. So we're talking about things that are never simple. So yes, you have to be pedagogical. You have to explain things to the society. There needs to be more commitment by all the actors, but I don't think that the people involved, I mean, I don't think that there are people against the change because they're not, because they're not sensitive to the environment. They don't have uh, this sensitivity because it's different to their way of life. No, but I think that um, they were referring to the fact that society, the whole society, not the ones that are impacted, the society needs to understand what is being done. Oh, okay, well then, then communication. I mean, it's very difficult to communicate. I have realized that it's very difficult to communicate and it's even more difficult to communicate in policy, in politics, because um, no matter what you say, if you're not noisy enough, if, if, if you're communicating, you're talking about your processes, if you're uh, trying to be in forums where we listen to one another, we try to provide with solutions, it's true that you're creating a good space in those societies, but it is very difficult to disseminate that, that message. That is not just a problem in just transition, it is a problem with regards to communication in general, the capacity we have to to share these pedagogical ideas in administrations. And it can happen with vaccines and many different things. There is too much noise in the, in the system and it makes it very difficult. So I think we have to build um, locally. That's where you can create that space for construction and constant learning. And then uh, with regards to the rest, I might not have an answer because lately I am a bit at a loss with regards to even having the best of uh, of experts and the best political will, it is very difficult to 
to send a sensible message to the society, but not because of the society, but because of the channels. Okay, then maybe that's a wish, right? To be able to communicate. Well, my wish is an international wish as well. I would like for us to have a good governance uh, scenario. The world is not pretty, it's not very pretty. There aren't so many governments who want to change things and I would like for that to happen. So we're risking a lot in this construction of international governance because, because we're all one and that's my desire. Okay, so we will have to ask La Casa Encendida and Transición Justa and the Green European Foundation to organize another debate so that we can talk about governance, pedagog pedagogy and communication because they're all very much linked. So I think that's one of the main challenges about how to do things or how not to do things. So this is actually an underlying topic and I think that this is something that is present in ecology transition in general. So I have been a horrible moderator. This was supposed to last just one hour and we have been here for one and a half hours and we, we could continue but we have to stop here. So I want to thank all those 50 people who have been constantly connected. I would like to thank you for listening and I know that this is a very interesting topic. So. So I would like to thank all the people and organizations who have made this event possible, La Casa Encendida, the Green European Foundations and Transición Justa, and the organizers are telling me that I have to remind you that on December 3rd, we will have the next event, which is towards a fair or just a tourism and low in carbon emissions. And we will see the different perspectives, environmental and economic perspectives from the different sectors who are really suffering in this pandemic. And you have the website there, uh, transicionverde.es, where you have all the information about this new event. And it's abundantly clear that we have to keep on talking, debating, uh, politicizing things and understanding things and, and dealing with all of them so that we can really understand them so that we can have a uh, just transition. So thank you all very much. Thank you all very, very much and we'll continue in the fight. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye-bye, thank you.